So welcome so much to the AZ Bio Expo. We have a wonderful, very quick day for you um, where you're going to get to see the depth and the breadth of all kinds of amazing things that are happening in Arizona. But you know, the funny thing is nothing happens with companies from the research end or from the commercial end or from the delivery to the customer end without capital. Because if there's no money, nothing flows. And if there's no flows, nothing grows. So our first panel today, we are absolutely thrilled to have. It is sponsored by our friends at BioPharm Insight. And I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Kimberly Ha, who will kick us off and introduce you to our panel. Kimberly? Thank you, Joan. Um, we today are. Uh, really lucky and fortunate to be in the presence of two uh, esteemed uh, investors. Uh, on to my left, Cynthia Eckbert Tsai, who is currently CEO and Chairman of ViroPro, a U.S. publicly traded company working on biosimilars and emerging markets, uh, specifically Malaysia. She spent 16 years uh, on Wall Street as Vice President with Merrill Lynch and Kidder Peabody involved in venture funds, IPOs. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Health Expo, the largest consumer health care event in the US. In seven years, she grew uh, this enterprise from concept to execution, attracting over 50 million consumers uh, to this event. She's achieved international recognition for her experience in private equity financing, and development of high growth companies by securing private capitalization from high net worth investors. Previously, she was also general partner at Mass Tech Ventures, a multi million dollar equity fund focused on technology development at MIT. Um, and joining her on the panel is Les Funtleiter, a healthcare strategist at Polywog uh, Investment Advisors, and he is currently responsible for the development and management of investment funds and related products. Mr. Funlighter has been involved with the healthcare community uh, since 1993, both as a portfolio manager and analyst, and has also worked uh, for a brief period of time uh, at Merck. Uh, prior to Polywog, uh, he was a portfolio manager uh, for Miller Tabak in New York. His industry experience includes the direction of clinical and business research um, at Merck. Uh, and he's also been a consultant to a variety of HMOs and hospitals. He also wrote the book on healthcare investing, published by McGraw Hill, uh, and is a guest lecturer at Columbia Business School. Um, so, with that, I wanted to kick off the first question for the panel, which is really giving the audience an overview of how funding has changed in the US. Um, and That's right. how funding has changed in the US um, in the healthcare markets, and what are some emerging trends uh, that you see? Thank you, Kimberly. It's very nice to be here. And I think the biggest change in funding has a dragonfly to a butterfly. And I don't know how many people are familiar with what a dragonfly does, but it's a beautiful insect, but it's a carnivore and it eats its prey while it's in the air. I think that the new funding philosophy is much more like a butterfly, that people look for an opportunity that they can participate in, that they can land in, and it's not a matter of eat your prey. And I think that's the biggest shift for funding today. And if you look at the Wall Street Journal, you look at the Financial Times, you'll see a lot of those feature stories are executives that made money in high tech that are looking for other opportunities to invest money personally. And that's a very big shift because individuals now are writing checks for $50 million. And that is new to the marketplace. Great, last oh, oh, I concur. Uh, having been through a couple of biotech cycles now, and I'm happy to say, and we'll probably talk about it later, that biotech is on an upswing uh, recently in terms of funding. Uh, 
the existence of, of the Jobs Act, uh, which was passed last year, has made um, capital raising both for public companies and for private companies uh, a lot easier. Uh, 15 years ago, it happened to be a hot cycle. Everybody wanted to invest. The last decade or so, the returns have been mediocre at best. Uh, but now, with returns coming back and the creation uh, of these new investment vehicles by the Jobs Act and uh, the in increased uh, nature of the par participat participatory capital where people want to invest in things they care about, uh, I'd say we are seeing uh, a vast improvement across a lot of uh, biotech companies. Thank you, Les. And I think that's an excellent segue into my next question, which is, what are some alternative financing options? Uh, we hear the term crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. Um, can you talk a bit about, since Polywog actually is the first healthcare-focused crowdsourcing fund, um, can you talk a bit about some misconceptions that sure. you know there might sure. be? And, uh, and I'm glad you asked. Uh, so Polywog, where I work now, is well, it's referred to in the genre of crowdfunding, but I think that's a misnomer. Uh, when people think of crowdfunding, they often think of Kickstarter or Indiegogo, which are funds, uh, sorry, a website set up that people can invest in projects. So if you like a movie and somebody's doing the movie, you can actually invest and you get a t-shirt. Uh, what we're doing is equity crowdfunding or equity raise uh, with accredited investors. Uh, once upon a time, you needed a, a lot of money and a lot of connections to participate in private healthcare companies, particularly biotech. Um, our studies show, and I believe it's out of Faster Cures, that only 3% of the 8.3 million accredited investors in the United States have ever invested in a private um, company. Uh, we think that's too low. We, we think that private equity and venture capital is an important part of everybody's portfolio. And so now, having the Jobs Act passed, it allows the number of participants in any given deal to go up, which uh, results in a smaller uh, unit size, which most uh, accredited investors can do. We're, we're talking an order of magnitude, so where once it cost $250,000 to invest in a private company, and now the number is more like $25,000. And now uh, we can make available opportunities people didn't know about uh, through social media, which is, uh, I know, something in the, um, it, it's um, something we will probably address in a little while, but it uh, has really changed the game in terms of capital raising and just getting the word out about what uh, small biotech companies are doing. Great. I guess um, for some of the audience members out there who are currently in the process of trying to raise funds, how can companies <laughs> best position themselves to secure funding in this current environment? And I guess from your experience, is there anything, I guess, what would be your tips um, and strategies for companies? Well, I like one of the quotes of Larry Ellison who said, everybody in the company is a salesperson for the company. And I think that that's a very critically important part for any company, whatever the stage, but certainly when you're looking for early stage investors, to talk to everybody in the company. Uh, it might even be the guy that picks you up to take you to the airport for a trip. He might know somebody that he's driven in his black car to the airport. So my suggestion on looking for funding is to bring the whole team together. Talk about who they know. Many times there's a rich uncle or there's somebody else in the family that would like to participate if they had an opportunity. And that is a very interesting way to start some initial funding. I think the other thing that's important is that many times we're focused on our own industry, but I think you need to look outside of the industry many times to find people that are interested in a cause. In our company, insulin is one of our development uh, opportunities in the biosimilar area, and we will work with a lot of people that are interested specifically in diabetes. So. They may not be interested in investing, particularly in a U.S. company with Malaysia roots, but many of our investors are Malaysian, so there are all kinds of uh, opportunities to look at your base. Who are you trying to attract? What would excite them about this investment? Are they going to see a cure? Are they going to see a chronic disease 
a resolution? Is there going to be a medical device that they themselves would find interesting? Because I think that's what you have to reach out to. It's not just a return on their money, it's the psychic income that they get from being excited about this investment. I think that's a very important part of reaching an investor. What do they feel emotional about this? Yeah. And we actually have a term for that, it's called passion capital, or we, we use that term. And uh, again, it's not, it, it, you, we still have to use traditional, because we are securities people, we still have to do traditional Wall Street peop, um, techniques and valuation. But hitting, um, a aggregating investors is a lot easier now with social media and the, the, the Jobs Act rules once they're fully passed. But I would say for entry level companies, early stage companies, uh, in addition to um, grabbing your affinity groups, and there are many out there, believe it or not, almost every disease has at least somebody who cares, uh, making your story easy to tell. So explaining how are you going to get from A to B to get both the social return and also the economic return. We find when we go out to the, the mass affluent, uh, they are at least interested in a, an, a story that's well articulated as opposed to a, a complex um, schematic. And I know that uh, that's sometimes hard, uh, particularly with uh, deep science, but um, to the extent that you can make it easy to explain and easy to understand and document everything, uh, it'll be that much easier to get investors. Great. I guess, what do you look for uh, when identifying, evaluating, and negotiating new investments for experience? Well, you know, the, in, in early stage company, what really matters is management. Um, you know, a good management team, uh, and, a, and it can vary. I mean, we, you know, in a perfect world, we love everybody who's been an entrepreneur seven times, but really, everybody has to start somewhere. Uh, but, but a management team with a, a vision and with a plan uh, plans matter. Uh, you know, in terms on the diligence side, what, what we run into a lot with early stage company is um, they have the documents, they're just not in an organized form. And this is sort of an easy thing that doesn't cost very much. I mean, almost everything in early stage financing does, but just having an organized set of documents um, is really maybe the, the easiest way, uh, the cheapest way to make things easy. Uh, and then, you know, have a way for us to validate the science or the, the commercial market. Um, once we know where to look, it's that much easier to do due diligence. Well, I agree with Les that presentation matters a tremendous amount. And I think having rehearsal of what you're going to say to an investor, you have to treat it just like you would a job interview. They're going to participate in what you've put together. So you should be very well prepared. I think the other very important thing that you learn when you're leading a company is you want the investor to invest in the management, invest in what you're bringing forward, but what's plan B? No one wants to invest only in plan A. They want to know what is your plan if what you're telling us does not come to fruition or as quickly. Do you have enough capital? Do you have enough resources? And what is your strategy for exit because getting into a private deal is one thing even getting in many times as a 144 buyer still locks you up for six months so how is the investor going to realize a profit or exit in this opportunity that you're presenting it's an excellent point um, I guess key elements that a company should have when they're pitching um, I guess what are, you've talked about management, I guess what are some other factors that are pretty high up there when you're evaluating opportunities? Or if you know, you're designed between two different companies, I guess, have there been any cases where you know, it was sort of you know, a factor sort of pushed one investment over the edge versus the other? Well, for us, you know, when we see similar companies, really it comes down to a plan. I mean, uh, especially with early stage science, it's very hard to tell, you know, in phase one or even in animal trials what's going to work and what isn't. But a plan uh, or a basis for the science, um, those are really the things that will push us over the edge. Uh, also, I would say on our part from, from the Polywog point of view, when we're looking at science, 
from a saleability point of view is, is there an identifiable crowd, an affinity group? Uh, if we can identify that quickly, that would be the kind of thing that would push us in a direction. And also has management um, gathered together and said, here's our network, these are the people we should reach out to. Um, you know, a motivated management team versus a non-motivated management team is uh, really what one will make our lives easier, which you know is very important to me, but also will actually make the process more likely to be successful, which you know is really what we all want. I, I think an absolute key for success for any business is persistence. And that's whether you're raising money or you have to go get a new customer. And I probably have had more response from a 4 a.m. E email that I sent out myself or received because emails t today show the time it was sent. And I think people are realizing there is a lot of effort put forth by a company that's sending you an email just not between nine and five. So I think you have to do things that are also follow up, follow up, follow up. And even the people that said no to you six months ago, when you've made progress, you wanna go back to those people. You didn't show up and do a presentation because you like them. You want their money. You want their commitment. You want their time. So don't treat it as a one opportunity. Go back to those people. Even with ViraPro, the company that I was parachuted into seven months ago by the shareholders, where we had to actually make a management change and a board change, there are people that I met with six months ago that said, good luck. Now those people have come back and said, we're on the team. We've seen what you've accomplished. We want to be part of this. And I can't emphasize, even with a seasoned track record, you can never give up those principles of persistence and follow-up and going back with your story and your achievements because you get involved in knowing what you're doing every day, but the rest of the world is doing their thing too. So don't be afraid to go back and let them know where you have made some achievements since your last visit. Great. Um, I guess uh, my next question, I know Cynthia, you're based out in DC. How has current US healthcare reform affected your uh, investment decisions? Um, and I guess, has that opened up um, any new areas for investment that are now more high value or high growth as a result of reform? Well, uh, I spent 20 years living in New York and the last six years living in Washington, and it really is the tale of two cities. The thinking is different, the contact levels are different, but I would tell anyone that has an opportunity that you should have a contact in Washington for your business model. The way that things happen in Washington and the thinking and the processing are different, the regulations are different, but you could easily get a team in Washington that supports your program if you work at it and cultivate Washington as part of your team just like you cultivate Wall Street or advisors. Uh, it should be part of your plan. Who needs to know about your process? And I know that uh, deciding that you've got the best invention, new drug, new delivery system, new application is one thing, but you have to consider who's paying for it. And if it's going to be the government, you better have those people early in the, on the team. And today, we do a lot of our work in emerging markets, which is even more government focused, because many of the emerging markets are all government funded as far as healthcare. So you can't leave them out of the equation, and you can't visit with them once. It's, again, a lot of repetitive action, but Washington is a fun city. It's a great city to get to know. Well, I, I agree, absolutely. You, you need to know Washington. It, uh, and I, I ver spent very little time in Washington other than a few times a year. Um, but it, and it does operate differently than Wall Street does. Um, that said, the ACA, uh, Obamacare, has created a whole ton of carrots and sticks uh, for companies to, to take advantage of or to be hurt by. And you really need to understand regulation uh, re regulation and reimbursement, otherwise you're going to wind up um, in difficulty. And we've, we've seen that even with big public companies who have big staffs, if they don't focus on it, uh, it can turn, it's more often than not, turn into a big problem for them. 
So there are a number, uh, we, we don't know, it's somewhere between zero and 50 million more patients coming online uh, next year and the years coming, so that's a, a wider uh, area of you know, a bigger market for, uh, for everyone. Uh, just pay attention to it. Uh, also, I would say that uh, you want to be on the side of the angels when you go to Washington, to the extent that there are any angels in Washington. Um, uh, you want, you, if, you can, if you can articulate a value proposition, and I'll, I'll name three, three and a half, if you can lower cost, improve quality, increase access, or show an innovation path, uh, and you can actually show that, uh, you will be on the side of the angels. Oftentimes we see a lot of, uh, and we're seeing this a lot in healthcare IT, a lot of companies who are just trying to add cost to the system with the latest uh, um, device. That's, that is almost certainly not going to fly either from the government, which is uh, becoming more and more responsible for payments, or even the new structures like accountable care organizations, which are now taking financial risk. So, uh, so even though it's not necessarily related to Obamacare, the, the cost control efforts have been going on for a while, and given uh, entitlement spending look to be going on for a, even a longer while, uh, I think that that's something you should consider. Um, I guess uh, in terms of future forecasts, uh, do you expect any changes? I guess what are your expectations for uh, healthcare financing, uh, the environment in the next 12 to 18 months? Um, I know you mentioned there's going to be an up. Yeah. Well, um, okay. I will. I will do attempt my great Karnak uh, invitation. <laughs> Uh, you know, and it's, you always go at risk when you go on uh, something that's being taped with a prediction. But as, as we stand here today um, in May of 2013, the valuations in all of healthcare, including biotech, have rebounded nicely from a very depressed level connected to Obamacare and the financial meltdown. We are improving. Uh, we are seeing, we'll call them the animal spirits coming to the fore. We're seeing a new investor base. Uh, the millennials are starting to become investors. Uh, I think that demographic shift is being underplayed. I think that's actually uh, more important than people give it credit for. Uh, they are taking more risk. We've seen a, a big uptick in interest in investing in health care because everybody knows it matters. It's 20 percent of the GDP, give or take. So I think at this point we're in, say, the middle innings of an upturn in um, investing in uh, healthcare as well as uh, returns. So you probably have another couple of years before we have to start discussing bubbles. Although I have, I did see an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago questioning if there was a biotech bubble, but it's the first one. So I think we still have some time. So I, um, two years ago, I probably would have been far more pessimistic because as an ex-hedge fund manager, that's my job. But uh, I think now uh, things are starting to turn. Uh, I wouldn't say they're hot, but they're getting warmer. I think there's going to be some challenges in the global marketplace on investing uh, because of some of the things that are happening with China and because of patent protection. There's going to be a much stronger discussion on intellectual property and how do you protect that if you are taking a product outside of the U.S. and to some of the other marketplaces. And we've seen a very interesting tracking over even three decades of biotech and high tech. So I think these are very closely in tandem. So as high tech advances, many of the things and reasons biotech has advanced is high tech. I think that you're going to see a lot more money coming from international marketplaces. We're talking to investors in places uh, that we would not have been talking to five years ago. But because of capital flows, that's going to make a big difference. I think there's going to be also a lot of scrutiny around where products are manufactured, where the innovation comes from, and there is still really a hands-off in the global marketplace to wanting uh, to have drugs that are made anywhere but the U.S. or have devices made in the U.S. We still really command tremendous prestige in the quality of what we offer. And while there's challenges in many of the things that the hurdles to go through approval process, it, 
has allowed us to keep our superiority in the marketplaces that people want, and that means that there will still be a very high demand. But I do think that the rest of the world is very well aware of that and is working diligently to catch up. So I think that's going to be our biggest challenge. Great. I guess uh, my last question really is uh, on parting words of wisdom to the audience. Um, I guess any tips, uh, advice, strategies that, or topics that we haven't uh, had uh, discussed yet that you want to share with the audience? Well, um, I don't claim to be the font of all wisdom, but I will attempt to part uh, some words. Well, the, the, the things that I, I see with successful early stage um, entrepreneurs in, uh, and this is even true of later stage too, persistence, uh, optimism, uh, which are two things that are often hard to come by when you're facing rejection. It's not an easy process, but that um, People are successful. We, serve, we have a whole bunch of entrepreneurs over at Polywog who've done it before and have succeeded. So I think those are the two things I would leave you with. I also want to leave everybody with uh, at least some sense of optimism that even though we hear that the world is, is falling apart, um, it, it might very well be, um, but then that is another set of challenges that, you know, is for probably the next panel. But the uh, Stay with it. Uh, I think that the healthcare industry is facing some very exciting times, ACA, innovation, and it's going to be a very interesting next decade, and uh, one would, that will, one, be profitable for all of us, but also uh, remember there are a lot of patients out there who will benefit from uh, the things that the folks in the audience are doing. Well, my two parting words of wisdom would be to find a company you want to grow up to be like. And that doesn't have to be a company in your industry. And I'm often surprised at how much visibility Steve Jobs had as the leader at Apple, and uh, even with challenges that Apple had and going back and forth in and out of the company. But I don't think too many people have ever looked at who was on his board. And when you think that the chairman of Avon is on the board of Apple Computer, it gives you a sense of how important design and customer care and all of the other things that matter in the whole Apple concept were. The head of the CEO of Genentech, uh, those are not people that you normally take a look at would be in a company involved in telecom devices, etc. So diversify the people you talk to. I think that is a really significant part of where ideas come from and or will help you hone your own ideas better. And I think that uh, another very important aspect to success is wake up every day and know where you're going. Have a goal for yourself every day because that's a very significant part of why you're waking up to, to show up, to get on the call, to be part of an email. And in our business, we know we work for our shareholders every day. And I wake up every morning remembering that, that that's my goal. So I think having a daily goal is just as important as the strategic vision. Stay on point with your daily goals. Thank you. Well, thank you both uh, for um, all your expertise and advice uh, and thank experience. You. Thank you. Thank you. And Kimberly, thank you. Um, for putting together a fabulous panel. It's not too often that we get leaders to fly in from New York and DC and to share with us, you know, not just what we see happening here, but what's happening all over the country and we are and all over the world. Thank you very, very much.